for this, the latest European Parliamentary Research Service event. Uh, as you may know, the EPRS organizes events uh, usually uh, about 50 times a year, and we've recently, of course, taken them all online as a result of the coronavirus crisis. And we're particularly delighted to be discussing aspects or implications of the current crisis with a very distinguished panel who I'll introduce very shortly. Um, we're also privileged to have as one of our partners in the EPRS, the OECD, the Organization for, uh, for um, Economic Cooperation and, De and Development, uh, which um, with us puts on two or three such events of this kind uh, every year. And we've been doing so for the last four or five years. So it's a great partnership. And we've also been building recently a specific partnership between our scientific foresight panel, STOA, and the OECD uh, on the specific subject of artificial intelligence. Now, today, we're going to be discussing the most recent uh, edition of the OECD Science and Technology and Innovation Outlook. And this is really devoted, among other issues, to the question of what will survive after the crisis in terms of the centrality of science and technology in our society. As everybody online, we're now up at about 50 participants, will know, um, one of the most intriguing features of the current crisis is the way that science and technology has both responded extremely quickly and effectively to the scale of the crisis on the one hand, and how the role of science and technology scientists and technologists has grown in importance and centrality in public debate in our society and in our public discourse. And many of us, of course, have been advocating this for many, many years, but now it's actually happening. So how to maintain the momentum of that and how to capitalize on, on it in the years ahead, at a time when governments are going to be under enormous pressure to contain public expend expenditure as a result of the implications of the current crisis. And to join us to discuss these very important issues, we're particularly privileged to have the former president of the European Parliament, uh, Jerzy Buzek, who's been a member of the Parliament since 2004 and, of course, was president between 2009 and 2012. He's a member of the Parliament's Committee on Industry, Research and Energy, the ETRA Committee, and also the Subcommittee on Defence. And he was Prime Minister of his own country, Poland, from 1997 to 2001. He's had a very distinguished career. Uh, both in opposition, in effect, under the previous communist re regime and in government and public service uh, since um, that time. He's also chair of the European Energy Forum, which is a platform for discussion between European energy stakeholders and policy makers. Uh, joining us, I think, from Paris is Andrew Wyckoff, who's director of the OECD's Directorate for Science, Technology, and Innovation, STI, and has headed that organization's delegations to G20 and G7 meetings uh, in the past. He joined the OECD after a very distinguished career in the United States, working for the then Office of Science and Technology Assessment in the US Congress, for the uh, US National Science Foundation, and for the Brookings Institution Think Tank. He's also served on various advisory groups uh, and um, is masterminding OECD thinking on the very issues that we're going to be talking about today, including being responsible for the publication of the Science, Technology and Innovation Outlook. From Brussels, we have Paul Hofheinz, who is the president and co-founder of the Lisbon Council, a very well-known Brussels-based economic think tank. He went into think tankery after having been a distinguished journalist working on the Wall Street Journal, the Central European Economic Review, and Fortune and Time magazines. And he's advised many governments on digital issues in particular. Last but not least, also from uh, Belgium, Ryan Hilder Vergelis, who is full professor in the Department of Management, Strategy and Innovation at KU Leuven in Belgium. She's also a senior fellow at the Bruegel Think Tank in Brussels, a senior non-resident fellow at the Peterson Institute for International Economics in Washington, DC, a CPR research fellow, and a member of very distinguished academic bodies of various kinds. She's also worked in the European Commission, both at the centre of the Commission for what was then BEPA, the Bureau of European Policy Analysts, and in various scientific advisory boards to the European Commission. So we could not really have a better and more distinguished panel to discuss these key issues. And I'm going to invite Jerzy Buzek to make some scene-setting remarks so that we can think about the issues today. Over to you, uh, Mr. Buzek. Thank you very Thank much. You. Uh, well, thank you for the inv invitation, first of all, and congratulations to you personally, um, Director Anthony Teasdale, 
and, and your service, uh, uh, European Parliament Research Service. It's great timing. And OECD um, report, uh, our look, fantastic idea just today, because we should uh, remember that regardless of the pandemic, Europe was already on the path of profound change. We should remember European Green Deal was decided half a year or even seven, eight months before any pandemic uh, uh, in all over the world. And uh, today, is, it is the most ambitious economic and societal transformation strategy to date. Over the next 30 years, uh, we will completely change not only the way we produce, transmit, use, uh, store energy, we will change the fundamentals of our economies, industry and transportation, the way we produce the type of goods we consume, the buildings we live uh, and work in, uh, the services we provide, not saying biodiversity, uh, treatment of waste as garbage, uh, or um, circular economy, no plastics, and many other ideas. In short, the European Green Deal will deeply change the way we we'll live and behave, all of us. Um, and um, But setting climate neutrality as our target, for me, it's much more a slogan than even a target. Of course, we should fulfill the expectations, but it has broader global implications. Europe's transformation will have impact on the health sector, food, agriculture, not saying by their, their, their face today, I just said a few seconds ago, but also on civil security and more broadly on our culture. All these are areas where they, we face truly global challenges. And uh, these are also challenges uh, we focus on with uh, Horizon Europe program. And uh, I must tell you, as uh, ITRE chairman and uh, member for many, many years, and also the negotiator of the Horizon Europe um, previous reporter of the framework program number seven, I have for years argued that with regard to research and innovation, our policies and instruments must be able to adapt to constant change, that Europe needs a support framework that is light and responsible. Uh, today, this is perhaps true more than ever. And let me go back. It is clear that without mobilizing our ability to innovate, it will not be possible for the European Green Deal and our transformation to succeed, bring growth, prosperity for the EU, our countries and all Europeans, and resolve the most pressing global challenges. With the pandemic, this mobilization becomes a challenge itself. If there is no, uh, if there is, uh, well, one single lesson to take, away from the global pandemic. It is how fragile is our sense of being in control. But the pandemic has also helped people understand the value of science and facts-based reasoning in helping us understand the new reality, how to avoid fake news, and the value of technology and innovation that allow us to adapt to these new realities, but uh, just uh, the pandemic and the different impact on different sectors of our economy, so the impact on our technology and innovation must have been different. Research into COVID-19 vaccination is just one example. Second very good example, internet and communication applications are obvious example of an area where the pandemic might have had a mobilizing effect, but the story with automotive industry or air transport is probably quite different. Well, uh, automotive industry transport um, with with no pollution and with no emission at all, quite different problem and issue. Uh, this is why the OECD report is so valuable. It allows us to track impact and see where additional support might be needed. So, being close to the OECD report, 
uh, now I am at the call of my short remarks at the beginning, OECD report should give us the right data about the actual situation and the impact on different sectors and types of activities. These could help us adapt the EU support to research and innovation where necessary so that Europe can truly recover, become more resilient and succeed in our economic and societal transformation for the good future of our citizens and for the good future of our whole planet. So congratulations to OEC, the IDEA and our European Parliament services. Thank you very much. Thank you very much indeed, uh, Jerzy Buzek, and it's always a great pleasure to have you at these events and also to uh, work together. Uh, Mr Buzek was kind enough to appoint me to his cabinet when he was president of the European Parliament, and our friendship goes back some, some years. Um, so that's a perfect uh, scene setter for Andrew Wyckoff to uh, share with us um, the principal <laughs> conclusions and the thinking behind the OECD's technology and innovation outlook. And after he's made that presentation, uh, he'll be followed by a roundtable discussion, Paul uh, uh, Hofheinz and Reinhilde Vogelers, which will be chaired by uh, Lieve van Wurzel, who is head of the Scientific Foresight Service inside EPRS, and recently produced uh, a book which we'll be featuring actually shortly in our book talk series for EPRS on a bias radar, um, which enables people to understand their hidden assumptions about policy making. So over to Andrew. Uh, thank you, Anthony, uh, and thank you, Mr. Buzek. I've never had a better introduction to this book than that, that one, and you've really set the scene quite eloquently and have identified uh, many of the major features of the outlook, which I'm going to go through very quickly, but you've also given us some homework for the future, which I very much welcome. I'm going to share my screen and show a PowerPoint. which, uh, one second, is always harder to do than it should be. Uh, there we go. Is that visible? Great. So it's my great pleasure to be here today and present this latest edition of our STI Outlook uh, to the European Parliamentary Research Service. And I just want to thank uh, Parliamentary Research Service uh, for the invitation, uh, as well as I look forward to the discussion from the, our distinguished guests today. Um, just, just to give you some uh, back, background, this is a publication we put out every two years, partly because things don't usually change that quickly. Uh, now may be a different time. And as has been said, the 2021 edition really focuses on COVID-19, some of the lessons learned, and some of the implications for the science, technology, and innovation system going forward. Uh, I will end with links to a lot of other additional material that goes far beyond this report, particularly uh, to the data that was just uh, mentioned. There are three main storylines to this year's uh, outlook. The first is, and again, it was just very well said that, that we've really seen an unprecedented mobilization of the STI system uh, fighting the COVID pan pandemic, an outpouring of new investments, new ideas, methods, and approaches. Um, and with it, we've, we've, after some years of maybe being in the woods a bit, we've seen the rising prominence of science and technology as a fundamental element both to injecting short-term resiliency, but also building uh, a capability to deal with external shocks in the longer term. Um, but with this stress test, we have seen um, the system's been stretched to its limits in many ways, and it has revealed weaknesses in the STI system. And we feel that these gaps need to be filled uh, going into the future, particularly if we're gonna deal with other large global challenges um, not the least of which could be climate change. So just moving into uh, the first part about just, just the, the 
huge mobilization that has occurred. And this, this figure shows that the world, by our calculation, spent nearly amassed five billion U.S. dollars in emergency funding in a very short uh, period of time. You can see just from March to June, three months. Um, and uh, these data included about 300 uh, million the Asian Pacific region, about 850 million in the European region, and an additional 3.5 billion in North America. And what's interesting, I find about this, this figure is the green portion of the figure, which shows uh, about 550 million U.S. dollars coming from philanthropic uh, foundations, which has really become uh, increasingly a new player in science, technology, and, and innovation. The, the dashed line about midway through uh, reveals basically when it became harder and harder for us to track this information. Sorry, can you see the website? Thanks. Okay. Um, very good. Um, uh, it became harder for us for us to track because we, we began to see, if we go to the next slide. One more. And again. Thank, thank you very much. That's, that's, that's perfect. Um, basically, after uh, June or so, we weren't able to get good figures on uh, COVID funding because they got intermingled in, into traditional mainstream funding me mechanisms, and we weren't able to separate what was unique to COVID and what wasn't. But this leaves us with a key question. When you amass this much money, what um, got displaced along, along the way? Was this all true new money? Or did we begin to leave some research um, aside? And if so, on what scale and, and where? And these are some of the unanswered questions we have going forward. If we could move to the next slide. Um, why we feel it's too early to discern that, 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 or to qualify the quality of the material coming out from this uh, uh, new sources of, of funding, we, we do, without question, find that the quantity of scientific output has been staggering. You can see in the right-hand figure here, we saw more than 70,000 biomedical scientific publications on COVID-19 were published just between January and in November. As you can see on, on the left-hand side, uh, the United States accounts for a large share of these, followed by China, but also the United Kingdom, Italy, Spain, France, and Germany have amongst the highest shares in, in the EU. And again, just the sheer quantity of output is very impressive. If we go to the next slide, you'll, you'll, you'll see that the, um, uh, as has happened in many other domains, we've seen COVID be an accelerant of slow moving trends that were already occurring uh, before. This is true in science, technology, and innovation as well. And this slide just shows that uh, many research databases and scientific publishers have removed paywalls so the scientific community could quickly share COVID-19 related data and publications, as well preprints, uh, academic papers that have not yet been peer reviewed or published have become far more common. Uh, again, this allows for faster diffusion of scientific findings, but also raises risks around research quality. Again, does this begin to mark an important change that could uh, result in the transition to a more open science system, which we've been seeing coming more slowly over time. Moving to the next slide, um, we've also seen an impact on how science is conducted. This won't surprise anyone. Much more science is occurring, uh, has shifted to the home place. This is of a, a survey we did in 2020 of about uh, 3,000 different um, scientists. Um, but we find that many scientists, 40% of the cases, especially among women, uh, experience a reduction in their time in research as a consequence of the pandemic crisis. Um, moving on, to the next slide, um, we've also seen that uh, with the pandemic, as is evident 
to the WebEx meeting today, um, uh, has accelerated the digital transformation that in science and innovation that was already underway. Uh, in this survey we undertook of scientists, about two thirds of them responding have experienced an increase in the use of digital tools for research. And we think this is a harbinger of things to come and has clear implications for the skill sets needed of existing and future scientists. Um, now, I want to shift gears a bit into the next slide, which is, which is looking at some of the R&D and where it has, has gone. Um, and this just looks at the business response um, to the, the crisis, which has been wide ranging and incredibly active. Uh, we're now seeing it on many fronts with the various vaccines that are coming um, in, into use. Um, uh, and many firms themselves have been very agile in pivoting to a more digitally enabled um, environment, as well as making much more use of partnerships with academia and with startup uh, firms. Again, I think this is a indication of trends we had already seen that may be accelerated uh, thanks to the, the, the crisis. Um, and as Mr. Moving to the next slide, as Mr. Buzik was just saying, clearly COVID has led to an increase in R&D in some firms, but we've also witnessed a decrease in others. And this is just a sample of us going through early annual reports of some of the key R&D spenders across the OECD by sector. The question that is open-ended a bit is typically we see R&D being very pro-cyclical with, with the economy going up in good times and contracting in bad. And the question is, could this crisis maybe be different? Again, it's too early to tell, but from what we've seen for some companies, they're increasing their level of R&D spend while the others are, are easing off. Uh, another question that's a bit open-ended is, could this crisis be a further widening and exacerbating the gaps we have seen between um, companies in their doing business R&D, some of whom keep investing and investing and are pulling away from some of their competitors who can't keep up. This is particularly a concern between large and small firms and between some geographic areas across the OECD. Now, now I'm really going to shift gears to the second half of, of, of the outlook. And if you go to the next slide, um, just having and you're going to have to click through. Um, this is an animated slide. Um, having kind of gone through uh, the impact of the pandemic on the STI system and the strong role of dig digital tools, now the second half of the outlook really looks more at what, does, what are the implications for the future and what are some of the changes we feel may be needed to help prepare for this future. So, if you go to one more slide, we find that, actually, it's going to have to be two, I'm afraid. Um, thank, thank you. Um, this slide identifies what, think, what we feel are five major challenges. Um, but as a backdrop to this, uh, many governments have, I think, appropriately, and to their credit, viewed the pandemic as a stark reminder of a broader need to transition to a more sustainable, equitable, and resilient um, societies. And you see this reflected in many of the recovery packages, which include not only a big digital element, but a very green element as, as well. This is particularly true, I think, for Europe. Um, but with it, the pandemic has exposed, as I said, limits in the research and innovation systems that we feel, if they aren't addressed, could um, prevent this potential from being um, realized. Um, uh, and, and with it, we have identified these five broad categories you see here in the slide. And what I'm gonna do in the remaining of, remainder of my time is quickly just step through each of these five to kind of set um, the floor for the discussion. So if we can go to the next slide. So, First is the need for what we feel a, a review to make sure that governments have the right balance of 
policies to support R&D um, and maybe give them more uh, directionality uh, going forward. And this, this slide just, just shows um, uh, government support for R&D uh, by SDG related cluster categories, uh, which are, I think are well known to this community. And, and what, what you can see is primarily we're still investing in industry and knowledge. And the trend lines have pretty much stayed the same from where they have been. Um, and part of this reason, go to the next slide, is due to the growing popularity of R&D tax credits. Now, the OECD has done a lot of research on R&D tax credits, and I, I strongly recommend you go to our website to, to look at it. Um, uh, R&D uh, tax credits are a very effective and easy to administer R&D policy, but it wasn't until just about 10 years ago that we started to measure them in terms of foregone tax expenditure, we began to compare them to other forms of R&D to support to get a sense of, uh, I don't know if it's apples to apples, but at least fruit to fruit um, within the uh, R&D form. And um, by many of the recovery packages and COVID itself is a demonstration of what we would call direct forms of R&D support. Things like contracts, grants, and awards that allow a lot of directionality. Um, but what, what you see here is the growing, that in fact, over time, those types of funding have declined across the OECD. Instead, what you've seen is this blue line is the growing popularity and generosity of R&D tax credits. Now, as I said, R&D tax credits, I think, are great, but they're indirect, untargeted, and tend to generate more what we call incremental innovations than more kind of uh, direct kind of moonshot or whatever you want to call uh, uh, out outcomes. Uh, certainly producing the mRNA, which took about 30 years to develop, uh, did not come about via R&D tax credits. They probably helped it along the way, but it was directed R&D, to give you one uh, example. Now, moving to the next slide, as Mr. Buzik said, um, we try to provide data at the OECD. Here is a slide that shows uh, our member countries, which now count to 37, um, and you can see the European Union in the middle. And you can see the relative role, the, the, the blue uh, is the tax support for business enterprise R&D, which is what BIRD stands for. Uh, the orange is the direct funding. And you can see different countries have a vastly different portfolio on how to fund uh, R&D. And in Europe, uh, we've seen um, within the EU 27, tax support has doubled over the past 10 years from what used to be 26% of total government support in 2006 to 57% in 2018. Now, this hasn't been uniform across all, all EU countries. Um, there's a great variety um, out, out there, but it gives you a sense of the overall trend. Um, if we could go to the next slide, where I begin to talk about this, this rebalancing of the STI mix. Um, to target more societal uh, challenges. And we've seen this occur across our member countries, including the EU, in both the adoption of more mission-oriented policy, as well as um, support to transdisciplinary research. So on, on, uh, on the first is, um, we find both of these are more helpful in uh, tackling what are more systemic uh, problems. They allow uh, crossing of different silos and uh, articulation towards a clear and objective uh, goal. Um, a lot of countries have been experimenting with mission-oriented innovation policies, um, and they take different uh, policies to accomplish these, these missions, and we begin to look at this and catalog this at um, the OECD. The EC has established several missions as part of its Horizon Europe. Uh, program. Now, transdisciplinary approaches, um, I, we think, are really important for tackling what we call complex or wicked uh, problems like COVID-19 or 
um, climate change. But truth be told, the research system isn't well oriented towards transdisciplinary research. Um, many of the research funding are still by discipline and um, follow a very hierarchical structure. Um, academics don't earn points for being transdisciplinary, rather they're supposed to be leaders in their own disciplines. A lot of the system is not well oriented towards this type of outcome. A second challenge coming forward, if we can move to the next slide, is uh, what we call the research precariat. Um, and just when we need STEM skills professionals, uh, more than ever, we're seeing uh, increasing precarity particularly for early career professionals. Um, many of them are employed on short-term contracts with no clear perspective of a permanent academic uh, position, and there's few incentives or measures to redirect them out of one uh, professional path into uh, others. Um, and again, uh, we feel this is a potential weakness in the system going forward particularly when we need to build resilience across all sectors in the economy. Moving to the next um, slide, if we could, is the need to adapt, adapt to the changing nature of the global scientific uh, commons. Uh, this figure just looks at scientific publications uh, developed in part of the COVID-19 uh, response. And, and you can see here, the United States and China are amongst the two major contributors to COVID-19 uh, publications. And you can see from, from, from the web who's uh, collaborating with, with whom. And, and you can just see how intertangled and interdependent uh, the global system is. About a quarter of all these pub publications are in fact co-authored with researchers based in a different country. And interestingly enough, uh, U.S. and China are one in each other's largest international collaborator. Now, this, we can go to the next slide, doesn't sit well with, uh, oh, with this comes the, the global ascendancy of China as a major science and technology player as of 2021. You can see this hasn't happened overnight. They've been extraordinarily persistent and dedicated to improving their S&T system. It has come from what may have been lower quality uh, a decade ago to now being on par with a lot of uh, other OECD players. Um, and they continue to dedicate money in, into this. They've been the source of several of uh, the vaccines. And, and with it, um, they've engaged in kind of vaccine-driven diplomacy, um, which has broadened their uh, influence uh, in many parts of, of the world. This comes at the same time as we're seeing growing tensions vis-a-vis -vis, um, some of the OECD members and China, but also growing calls for technology sovereignty in, in many countries, and just a, a, a retreat a little bit from the collaboration that we were seeing in earlier slides. Um, at the root of this is, is the, the difficulty of uh, defining and building trust. And with that, we think there's a need maybe to uh, look a little bit at reciprocity issues and issues of research integrity. The fourth problem, which is mixed with uh, China and, and others, is just the reality that these are global challenges that require global solutions. You can see how this has panned out um, on this slide for, for COVID. Um, uh, these institutions, I think, have been proven and tested throughout the uh, pandemic, but it also underscores that uh, they were brand new. They really need to be institutionalized and reinforced, uh, not, not only politically, but financially to help us going forward. Um, just to, to, to conclude, uh, and I'm just about there, um, we go to the next slide. I'm moving to, to some of the uh, final take takeaways of the report we find that are particularly relevant for, for Europe. Um, it's clear, all of us, particularly governments, are gonna have to be uh, 
agile to meet the challenges going ahead and prepare for the uh, unknown. Um, these are, here are some of the uncertainties that we have put forward in the green boxes uh, in, in the slide um, that we feel that policymakers and policy analysts, such as those assembled here today as the distinguished uh, discussants, uh, need to begin to zoom in on. Um, we do feel that we, we can begin to maybe up our game here a little bit with better strategic foresight. Uh, which is not to be called forecasting, it's to begin to map out some different scenarios, the challenges, what might be those unknowns that we need to prepare for going forward. Um, we, this is not well uh, integrated yet in the STI policy making, and it's one of the things that we suggest they should get greater attention going forward. Just to conclude, um, my Next slide just shows six of the major takeaways we find for uh, the EU. Uh, I've talked about the policy support for business enterprise uh, R&D, so, um, mission-oriented uh, R&D is, is getting a lot of attention these days. There's still a question on how best to do this and what are some of the reinforcing policies. We still find that scale up, scaling up of startups is a problem for Europe, and I know uh, Paul Hoffheins of Lisbon Council has uh, touched on this issue in the past. Um, fundamental science, we would not have many of these vaccines if we hadn't invested for a long time in this fundamental science. Um, again, uh, does Europe have the right mix of it um, going forward? Uh, we do find that COVID, like for many things, uh, presents an opportunity to maybe rethink how these STI systems operate and what they should look like going forward. Uh, and last but, but not least, um, how will Europe equip itself um, to have retune its STI policies to the changing times that I think are very likely to come. If I could just end with three slides, uh, it's a bit of a, a provide information for the, the audience on how to gain access to the STI Outlook. Um, it is available uh, online. There's an accompanying website that provides you with a lot of information that goes beyond the book. It's a dynamic source for insights and data that we're updating. If we go to the next slide, I should just say that there's multilingual summaries uh, available, um, presentations, uh, as well as um, a blog and info uh, graphics, such as what you see on the right. Last but not least, one more slide. Um, we have, um, with, thanks to European uh, Commission uh, funding, we have the Science, Technology, and Innovation Policy Compass Platform, STIP Compass Platform, which contains data on almost 700 policy initiatives from 43 countries, plus the EU covering a wide range of topics, um, and you can analyze uh, different trends yourself. And just moving to the last slide, let me thank you for your time and uh, attention, and uh, thank my colleagues listed here who were able to put, generate this, this report during what wasn't the easiest time uh, of, of confinement. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much indeed, Andrew, for that very clear and very stimulating presentation. We much appreciate it. We much appreciate more generally the um, willingness of the OECD to share its analysis in, in this way. We're now going to move to the panel discussion. Libe will chair that. She's my colleague from EPRS who heads up our fun scientific uh, foresight uh, team. Uh, and uh, just to remind you that we've got Paul and Ryan Hilda, Andrew, of course, and uh, Mr. Buzek, was, I think, and may still be online, and he, of course, is free to come back in at any stage if he would like to do so. So over to you, Livé. Uh, thank you. And I don't know if I'm unmuted. We can hear you clearly. Yes, presentation. 
deep things, and there we go. Uh, before we uh, go to um, a debate with the uh, audience, uh, let me give the floor to uh, Paul Hofheinz uh, for about 10 minutes and afterwards to René de Vugelers. Paul Hofheinz, um, I don't know if you can unmute yourself or... I'm unmuted. Fantastic. Okay, Leva, Le Le thank you. Let me thank you and Anthony and the entire ETRSC and of course Andy Wyckoff for this fantastic study which informs uh, so much of uh, what so many of us uh, think um, about uh, this topic. Um, I just wanted to say briefly, I think you've got the speaking order a little bit wrong. Usually the warm-up act uh, goes before the star performance uh, and unfortunately uh, uh, speaking after Andy Wyckoff is kind of like coming on after the Rolling Stones. Um, so I have to uh, I have to apologize if you if you uh, if you get the warm up back after you've already heard the performance we all came here to to uh, to see um, Andy that was fantastic and really interesting and rather than go over uh, the same uh, material that you covered I want to talk briefly about something uh, that you didn't cover very much although you did touch on it one or two times uh, before I do let me just say in passing that you had some very important things to say uh, to us about how um, R and D spending uh, might be changing structurally under COVID. Uh, it's tremendously important and I look forward to going back to that section and reading it uh, even more closely uh, because the implications are very large and it's important that we sort them as we move forward. But that's not uh, what I want to talk about. I want to talk a little bit about what I think our biggest problem is here in Europe. Um, and it's not spending and it's not science, uh, it's diffusion. Uh, it's the fact that uh, too many of our discoveries, too much of our unquestionably world leading science and we should all thank our lucky stars we're very good at that here it's it's not a question of that the, too much of it stays in the laboratory and if we're really serious about um, addressing this problem structurally as we leave the the crisis as we pull out of the pandemic uh, we need to think not only about uh, how we're spending our money on science but essentially whether that money uh, is uh, turning into i mean you mentioned startups but not just startups but uh, products that consumers can use and things that people can see and touch and feel. Just as a precautionary tale, I might mention in passing, um, invented right here in Europe, uh, the television 40 years ago. It's of course the Japanese who turned it into a major global business. Uh, the CD-ROM also invented in Europe. The MP3 also came from Europe. Even the streaming model for music, well, these are all European inventions which were, were very successfully uh, commercialized elsewhere. And we've just, uh, at the Lisbon Council just this morning, uh, we published a blog from Jonathan Warham at uh, Sade University, uh, looking at uh, some of the European Innovation Council um, investments, and they're all very good, uh, but they're all uh, very high science and very much in the laboratory. And the question I have is not, how are we going to find these tremendous vehicles to fund? We, we have them all over the place and we should continue funding them. But how are we gonna turn them into things that people can see and use and feel and that will meet the great social challenges of our day. I just, I just note in passing, and, and this isn't funny at all, but what I'm about to say may be a little bit funny, is that in some ways the COVID crisis is typical of the problem that um, I'm trying to point out. Um, we invented the vaccines here. Where are they? Um, I'm still waiting for my letter personally. And um, I, I, I only say this that, um, is a sign for what can happen if we don't take what I'm trying to say more seriously here. It's not enough to invent the vaccine, although thank God we did. We need to invent it and we also need to invent all of the things to get that vaccine into the hands of people, uh, which we apparently haven't done terribly well. And I'm very disappointed about that. And I know many other people at this meeting are as well. Uh, we set that issue aside. Um, this raises a second question, which is what can governments, policymakers, the European Parliament, those of us on this call, even the OECD, what can we do about this? And I would say there are really two things um, that we should address. I'm sure there are many more than two, but I'm gonna talk about two of them right now. Um, the first one is, and I, I, I apologize, Anthony, you and I have been in this game a long time and I start to feel like a real old timer when I, when I bring this up, but it's the internal market. Um, my son uh, is in the European school right now and I uh, had to do a presentation today on the history of the European Union and I was up last night explaining to him what the coal and steel community was, uh, what Jean Monnet and Robert Schumann had done, that essentially they had this idea that instead of fighting each other, we would cooperate and collaborate. And it began where? It began 
by bringing a market together around common standards and common regulation. And it's grown into this tremendous thing that we know today. It's a very powerful idea. And I worry that we've left it behind a little bit, that uh, it's still there, but we don't turn to it in times of trouble. And I think that um, coming out of this crisis, um, we might want to make a stronger, uh, more concentrated effort uh, to complete the internal market, uh, to get it working the way that it's supposed to get, and to give us the scale that we need. Because one of the things I was struck by in your presentation, Andy, was, um, of course, the United States uh, way out in the lead on this. But if you took all the European countries and combined them together, uh, we would actually be in the lead if we were a single market. And we all know we're not. I'll, I'll leave, leave that thought there. Um, I think we could do more on the internal market, um, in particular because the internal market has a sneaky or tricky, I don't know what to call it, but it has a side effect, which is that it puts consumers into the equation. And that alone would go a long way towards solving the problem that I was talking about a moment ago. In traditional innovation theory, what people talk about sometimes is push and pull. You need the push of the science and the pull of the consumer. And this is why the internal market actually is an innovation policy. If we see it in the right way and we structure it in the right way, which brings me to my second thing that, um, uh, that Europeans can, can that, that, that policymakers can do. Um, I gave a little list a second ago of all of the things that have gone not terribly well in the transition from science to market. But there's one area where things went very well, for a while at least, and that was the GSM standard. Um, for a certain period of time, we led the world in cell phones here, and it was a policy-making success. It was because the standard had been created, led, and originated uh, by the European Union, um, which created a single market in Europe for cell phones, and very successful uh, effort for everyone, really. Uh, we all remember Nokia, that was a great thing too, but I think we've all got one in our pocket right now as well. It was a su success for every one of us. So I just mentioned that this to me in some ways is the European Union at its best. The European Union does many other things too, but one thing it can do here is give us the standards that create the framework conditions that create these markets that drive innovation. Um, and this is the part I'm missing a little bit. And I, I say that not to criticize the other part, we have the science. I'm talking about the part that I, I worry about where we're, where we're weak and where we might uh, stand to devote a little more attention. Uh, look, I mentioned consumers a second ago. I, I can't stop speaking without mentioning the service sector and the service economy. Uh, this in many ways is one of the things that I'm most worried about. We still think of the economy in very 19th century terms as if we were all making a bunch of goods that we were going to sell in other markets through, through trade deals. And, that's still an important part of the economy, but most economic activity now is in the service sector. I think in places that are leading, it's as much as 80% of all of the economic activity in those areas. Um, and we still don't think enough in those terms. Just to go back to what I said earlier, we still think of a vaccine as something you make and then your work is over. It's not, it's something you make and you have to find a way of distributing it to people. We need to think more about that. I just mentioned in passing, I mean, right now, there's a lot of talk about Google and all of this enormous data that Google has, and they do have a lot of data. But to be honest, if you took all of that data and you brought it over here, would we know what to do with it? What Google's doing that people like is they, they, they provide a service on top of it that's extremely popular. And the same is true of Facebook. There are plenty of things you can criticize these companies for. But let's not overlook that people like the service that they're getting from them. We'll set aside issues of size and concentration for now. I just want to point that thing out, that, it, that there are things going on with those companies that we could stand to learn from. Um, finally, I guess maybe the last thing, Andy um, and Anthony, uh, you as well, um, our voice matters. Um, we're the people, you know, here we are talking about innovation. Uh, people are joining this call to, to listen. Um, it's very important that we grab onto these themes and talk about these themes because in a strange way, conversations like this can and will drive policy. Um, and the more we can give good, well-evidenced um, uh, advice to the people in power, uh, the quicker we will be to have the, what is the phrase you use, Andy? It's lovely, actually, sustainability, inclusivity, and resilience uh, that, a, that a good STI system can give us. 
Um, I see the system as still a little unbalanced, unbalanced in ways that we've known about in Europe for a while now. Nothing I've said uh, in this call is, is terribly new, uh, but a lot of it is missing from the front line of discourse these days. And I think it needs to be back there as we crawl our way out of this, um, this, uh, this, this crisis. Let's, let's not just innovate, but let's put innovation in the hands of people and let's let uh, consumers and citizens um, take us where we need to go because, uh, because they will. And uh, that's what I wanted to say, except maybe to thank you again, Andy. I look forward to diving back into your report. Um, and uh, what was it you said? 700 uh, STI policy initiatives that you track. I don't even know about 700 STI policy initiatives, let alone have the capacity to track them. So thank you for, uh, for such an amazing uh, piece of work and for synthesizing it in ways that we can all wrap our minds around here. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Paul, for your reflections. Um, I will pass the floor to uh, Professor Vögler. Uh, the, the floor is yours. Yeah, so let me also start by uh, thanking the OECD and Andy for the reports and the slides. Uh, when I was going through them, I was taking a lot of notes. I got all excited. And what bigger treat for a researcher than to be challenged into uh, into new thinking uh, here. So thanks for that. Um, your startup point is well taken. The importance of science and the science and innovation motor critical for solving the COVID uh, crisis, but also beyond after uh, and also other challenges like climate change here. And that's why it really matters to understand better how that science motor will actually function um, in the future. So very positive that you say that the financing for science uh, doesn't seem to be uh, going down. But what's also important to look at is the shifts within that overall funding for science, uh, shifts from other areas into COVID uh, research here. And even within COVID, whether there is now much more emphasis on, on more the shorter term, low hanging fruits uh, here. And what about COVID uh, research that we need for the more longer term, the next generation vaccine? the more risky type of, of, of research uh, here. And I'm a bit worried for that because I don't see very many signs uh, of that. Um, also good news is uh, the, the increase in the COVID publications uh, and even beyond PubMed, also in other areas like in my own area, the field has really shifted towards studying the impact of, of COVID. Um, and if I look at the rise in publications and correlated with the rise in funding, it really goes beyond. Uh, if you look at the speed and the volumes, it's it's driven by more than just the funding. And I think that's an important signal because it, it's, it shows that we should trust the researchers and their bottom-up ideas. They want to really help to improve society here. And um, so the bottom-up uh, initiatives of researchers uh, play a very important role to make sure how quickly we can actually respond uh, with, with uh, science uh, here. Um, another important uh, evidence that, that I found interesting was your uh, collaborations, your international collaborations. Lots of that we know is, is going on uh, in, in international collaboration. But what studies have shown is the impact of COVID uh, is that it uh, would indeed we keep on being internationally collaborating, but within existing networks. And what's really much more uh, at stake here is new international networks that are being formed. And that relates again to the new next generation type of research here that will be a bit more um, in jeopardy if we if we uh, if we continue to work on existing networks uh, here. And related to that is also the importance of international mobility, uh, which of, of researchers again is a very important component, um, particularly for young uh, generations of researchers where they are trained, what skills that they will have, and also which kinds of networks that they are building uh, here. So in that respect, international mobility. If that's challenged, uh, and I hope you also have some uh, evidence to, to show on that here. That will also be important to identify what the next, how the next generation um, of, of, of the science machine would actually look like you know, here. Uh, so overall, I share your uh, enthusiasm of the power of science here, but I think we also need to be careful about some of the potential shifts that may make it um, uh, not well, well, may challenge how good it will be for the next uh, generation uh, of challenges uh, here. And then with respect to business R&D, also good news that it's quite resilient, uh, although it's somewhat sector specific here. So again, I think what we also need to look at is um, 
shifts within sectors, like in, in pharma, uh, so to which extent uh, have there been shifts from uh, clinical trials for other diseases that have been stopped or, or, or put on hold uh, in order to support uh, the um, clinical trials in, in, uh, for vaccines here. Um, also important to look at, but you already hinted that this is growing, possible growing inequality uh, here in the sense that is it the leaders that are forging ahead? We definitely see that within the, um, within the digital sector here. Uh, you could argue that the digital technologies have, have now been much more quicker adapted by laggards and that there would be some evidence of catching up. But I think, again, this has to be very carefully monitored uh, with the EIB. Their survey on digital adoption seems to suggest that uh, the, the gap is not closing uh, here, so that it's the, the force of leaders forging ahead is way stronger than the catching up uh, here. And a third important point is indeed this business R&D, to which extent are they actually using the science uh, results? So here what Paul was also saying, this like link between science and innovation. And I think there, the vaccine case also made that clear, very critical issue is IP uh, issues uh, here that may actually definitely um, uh, shape access to science and technology uh, here and the whole issue of, of of licensing do we see enough licensing going on definitely is something that needs to be taken into account um and to answer a bit what the the issue that that uh, paul actually raised in terms of how can we assure that there are good enough links from science to to industry here that the ideas don't stay in the lab well a very important mechanism that we know for analysis is the mobility of people uh, here is researchers that move from the lab to take up positions in, 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 the, in the corporate sector and vice versa here. So that's why I also definitely like your mobility, your, your career paths and that they should be much more diverse uh, here. I think it's really important, particularly this mobility between science uh, and industry here. And actually the, the example of, of, of the COVID vaccines makes that very clear. So one of the, the star scientists on the MNR are and RNA technology and uh, pet, uh, so publications and patents, Carico. Uh, she actually she moved to uh, to BioNTech uh, to, to become the, the CEO for research there. So really identifying how important the mobility is of researchers here, and if that becomes also constrained, uh, that may also be uh, uh, putting in jeopardy our future use of science into innovation. And then finally, with respect to policies. So I, I fully buy most of your policy uh, suggestions here. Uh, although, of course, the question is always is how to do this uh, here. So you, you argue for a more targeted and systemic uh, policy uh, approach. Yes, uh, of course. Um, but the question is, does targeted always has to be through missions uh, here uh, and to top down? Uh, and that's why I also made the point initially, you also should trust the bottom up research uh, here uh, because because researchers uh, are also very adept in, in responding very quickly to, to challenges here and may sometimes be better able to identify how science can contribute than some top-down uh, selected um, uh, areas uh, here. So I would be very careful with, with, uh, with uh, equating too much targeting with uh, top-down and with uh, missions here. You really need a very good balance between bottom-up uh, and, and, and top-down uh, here. And then, of course, if you go for the more mission oriented, that needs to be part of the story too, definitely. The question is, do we know enough on how to do this uh, here? So selection of missions, we, we have a lot of good uh, cases, but from other areas than from biotech, uh, like for instance, the war on, on, on cancer was already in the 70s with Nixon, <laughs> uh, but it was a complete failure here. So I do think we need to think still very carefully and learn quite a lot of how to do these mission-oriented uh, approaches uh, very well. So it's not an, an easy uh, easy solution here. We're counting on the help of the OECD to help us on, on, on learning more on that. And then finally, so the, the importance of, of this global coordination of policies, fully agree with, with that. I'm not so sure that the example of, of uh, ACT and COVAX is a very good example. It, 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 it has some good features here, but it clearly also shows how difficult that exercise is. is there's still very many um, imperfections uh, here. Uh, so 
again see it as a kind of experiment and what we should learn from that what i particularly find also challenging is to really make this into truly global where uh, you can actually um, counter a bit the, the the geopolitical nationalism that's that's going on here uh, and i'm particularly also worried about the role of china in these international networks here so it used to be very open uh, it used to be uh, attracting science and technology talents and mobility of students uh, here uh, for catching up, the question is, and it was very important for also international networks, like like you show here. But if there is this trend towards becoming much more close, much more nationalist, what will this imply in terms of those international collaborations uh, here, uh, and also international collaborations uh, within the policy um, within policy settings here? So quite a lot of challenges, uh, and that means that we will need quite a lot of STI outlooks from the coming years to be very closely monitoring what's going on. Uh, thank you, Janelle. So we got... Sorry. Um, so thank you all. So we have an overview now of the insights from the OECD report. We got... Um, a view on the innovation in the EU bubble. We got um, you know, reflections on networking of um, research and the mobility maybe also within the bubble. Um, and I think I will add maybe something on the role of a scientific advisor, of, of policy advisors. So um, Andy Wyckoff, you mentioned in the um, as one of the challenges in this nice overview graph um, to promote transdisciplinarity to deal with complex problems. And um, the impressive OECD report also refers to communicating uncertainties and alternative views, for instance, on COVID as a possible source for undermining trust in scientific advice. Um, so there is, um, a very important link between uh, scientific evidence for policy and societal trust. And I think that uh, policy advisors, as uh, a, lot in, a lot of policy analysts in the audience, um, should be the guardians of responsible scientific advice. And then I come back to the systemic approach, which was mentioned uh, several times before this afternoon. It's uh, that a systemic approach for such um, complex systems or uncertainties is really required. As I see the role of policy advisors and policy analysts is really to act as the guardians of the proper functioning of the integrity of the advisory process. And the systemic view is the first element there. Uh, the systemic view um, when using scientific evidence for a policy is also including um, a transdisciplinary reflection about the topic, but also including who can be affected in society. So not purely the research and the policy, but who in society uh, can feel all the consequences of the decisions um, taken. Uh, take, for instance, the vaccines. It's already mentioned. It's not just uh, developing a vaccine. It's also getting it uh, to the places, um, to the vaccination centers, um, to invite the citizens to be uh, vaccinated and so on. So a systemic view is always important to see all the extra issues which can happen. Um, so I have uh, four points. The systemic is one. The in When I speak about um, responsible scientific advice, so responsible policy advice based upon evidence, the second one is, um, and Anthony already spoke about it, is about biases, being aware of our own biases, but also of all the other stakeholders in the system, which we can design by um, taking a systemic view, by taking the bigger picture of the issue taking a, a step backwards. And um, it's also important to look to our own biases. So um, it's more easy to reflect about other people's possible biases, but um, we also uh, can look into our own biases, which can influence a lot what we write as policy analysts for policymakers. 
the third element uh, which I see uh, crucial in responsible scientific advice is taking a 360 degree approach, um, not only on the systemic approach, but looking from all angles. So looking from economic, from societal uh, impact societal aspects of a certain issue. For instance, on when we speak about vaccines, there are a lot of societal aspects that we feel free when we have got our jab, for instance, uh, that um, we lock up um, elderly people because they risk uh, to get in intensive care and all these things, that students uh, get in troubles because they don't have the opportunity to, to follow classes. Uh, Renilda just told that she, she didn't um, she doesn't give um, classes anymore at university at this moment due to uh, the, the lockdown. So there are a lot of societal elements. There is also all the um, uh, technological issues. There are the economic issues. Um, there are the ethical issues, uh, who gets who get the vaccines first and so on. Um, and there are also a lot of uh, political implications. Um, so look from all the aspects, also demographic, um, there is a big difference for different groups of ages, different um, areas in the world and so on. Um, and then the, the fourth one, so the first one was systemic view, the second one is exploring the biases, the third one is the 360 degree looking really from all angles, and then the fourth one is explore possible impacts of any pos uh, policy action which could be based upon the evidence. And I, in my uh, view, it's the task of uh, scientific advisors really to uh, guard over the quality of this system. So to assess also the possible decisions on unintended impact, for instance, on other areas and to avoid um, unpleasant surprises or such as adverse or perverse effects of uh, policy. Um, so I think um, I see that there is already um, one that there are we already received a few questions, but the question and answer um, box is open in the chat. So I invite all the participants um, to ask all the questions. You can also indicate for whom it is mentioned. And I already can start with the first ones I have. Um, a first one, uh, the, the ones I see so far all come from in-house. Um, a first one from um, uh, Mihalis Kritikos, uh, a colleague from uh, STOA in EPRS. Um, we saw, so um, I state what, what he writes, uh, we saw that during the pandemic, scientific advice took different forms and did not seem to be well coordinated across the EU. What's your take on that? How can we ensure that science will be trusted not only by the EU policymakers, but also by the public? Um, anyone volunteering to take this first question? Well, Andy? I believe I, 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 I actually think you're the one addressing this more, more than anyone else, but it was many things that you were talking about of better recognizing that the stakeholder community is much broader than just the scientists themselves or the people who are funding them or maybe the businesses that are engaged in science, but it's the broader um, public. It's without doubt that the last few years have seen kind of an erosion of trust in government and in expert advice broadly. Uh, and, and there's a question of, of I, I do think COVID maybe has uh, helped to bridge that uh, image a bit, where I think a lot of the experts have done a very good job of communicating best that they can under very difficult circumstances. The, 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 the conundrum, though, is, okay, we're, we're a year into this, um, at least um, at, here in Europe. Uh, but if you go back to those early days, there were so many unknowns. And if, if, if you remember, we weren't even quite, like, quite sure how the contagion was occurring. There was, um, 
a lot of worry about picking up the virus on, on hard surfaces and, and, and so forth. Uh, and we've, we've just learned, learned a lot. And so there, there's a question of comfort level of, of scientists. Um, I think the public was a little frustration with, had some frustration early on about the, the fact that we couldn't provide clear um, predictions and, and examples. Um, I think that, um, I think the scientific community has come back and has done a good job of addressing um, a lot of that. I guess my, my, my issue here is how far can you go as a scientist uh, in, in trying to assert authority and, and give people good instructions, but at the same time, um, limit yourself with what's clearly a lot of uncertainty about the nature of the problem. Um, that's not really an in, in, in answer, but there, there is a lot of governments have, have done a very good job of better public engagement throughout the whole process. Um, inviting um, and digital tools, I think, have, have aided this in a way that we didn't have 20 years ago. I can perhaps add a little bit of that with respect to, to the frank that was also part of the question uh, here is that if if the advice coming from science is not always going in the same direction uh, so of course to some extent this is also because science is not always able to identify always the same type of answers here there's still a lot of uncertainty and that's what what also the public should understand too is that uncertainty doesn't mean that science cannot be trusted uh, it just means that you have to trust the scientists that they would be willing to investigate further before they can actually and that just makes them sometimes a bit more careful in what they say and then that is interpreted as being that it goes in too many different directions here. So I think it's also a um, bit learning on the two sides, how, to, uh, how to, to bring that message of uncertainty here without breaching the trust uh, in, in science that it can deal with uh, uncertainty here. And I think that's where then also the role of intermediaries play too, is uh, they should actually be able to translate these, these still complex messages that scientists will bring here into something that's, still, that's clear enough uh, without jeopardizing the trust here uh, and these intermediaries can be journalists can be policy advisors can be think tankers uh, here um, but of course they also should be seen as sufficiently independent and not, not part of the establishment that uh, that the society doesn't trust uh, here so quite a challenge <laughs> Thank you. Um, I think indeed that communicating uncertainties and alternative views under, can undermine easily trust in scientific advice. And therefore, I uh, think I can repeat that it's important to balance evidence with societal views, but keep really uh, the distinction between what's evidence and what are societal views. And of course, it's very tricky as scientists to, because you have different roles. You are a scientist on the one hand, but you also are a member of society. You are a, a parent or a friend or active in a, an area which is touched, for instance, by uh, COVID and so on, like the cultural sector. So you always have different roles and it's important to make a distinction between what's real evidence and uh, what's also changing evidence, which creates also a basis for, um, for reluctance. Um, it, I will go to another question coming from Iman Nonen from our uh, Strategic Foresight Unit at the EPRS. Um, should public authorities insist on a share in the profits of innovation which are developed with the help of public funding? Are there good models for this in practice? And I can add maybe his second question, which he addresses to, um, to Andy Wyckoff. Do the data show a negative impact on R&D expenditure correlating to the greater propensity of corporations to distribute rather than to retain profits in recent decades? Has it meant greater dependence on public funding for innovation? Um, Andy, could you take this first? Thank you. That's, that's a very good question, which I don't think we've done the analysis of. And so let me just make sure I, I understand the question, which is, 
basically the propensity of undertaking business funded R&D, own R&D funding based on the governance model of the firm, which is whether to retain profits or to distribute them. If I understand that is the question. I'm, I don't think we've ever looked at it. Um, it would be interesting to, to see uh, because I think what you would also have to do is we've seen the governance funding of the, uh, what Paul was referring to as kind of big tech, uh, big digital tech change with um, very closely held ownership of controlling function, even though the stock is more widely owned. Uh, that's not answering the, the, the question, but I, I, sorry, I'm gonna have to double back and we'll add that to the work um, pro program and hopefully be able to come forward uh, in, in the future. I, I do think there is a tendency um, of those firms that are preoccupied by stock price and keeping shares high um, with uh, maybe not investing as much in R&D for the long term. There's some companies that have avoided um, keeping stock price or, or just not had it be a preoccupation, but have rather been looking at issues of building for the longer term. And when they do that, they, they invest more in R and D, but I'm sorry for the non-answer here. Um, but I welcome uh, Paul and, and and others. I I, I know have been um, looking at this uh, from their own perspective. Um, if I could toss the ball to. Uh, you're you're muted, Ryan. All right. Oops, sorry. <laughs> um, so maybe I can uh, continue the unanswering question. <laughs> so I think this is really a very important question. But the question is, where where do you want society to take its its return here? Is it in the short run in terms of sharing in the in the benefits of of, of what you're sponsoring, or is it more also the long term? Uh, and that means including also looking at making sure that there are enough incentives. That you keep on having the incentives to innovate in future here and that you get the returns in terms of new innovations in future here so that's a very delicate balance and we do have here two important instruments we have subsidies and we have also ip the patent system here and it's the combination of the two actually that needs to be balanced here such that on the one hand, we, we, we do get enough incentives here, but at the same time also making sure that society benefits from getting the innovations at fair prices uh, here. Um, and that's a very delicate balance. Uh, so the Bay Dole Act, for instance, uh, deals explicitly with making sure that all those research that got funded, that got subsidies, uh, that still the incentives for innovation are kept there uh, by granting IP rights to, uh, or transferring the IP rights from the funder to, to, to uh, the recipient uh, here. Um, but of course, then the question is, with this Bay Dole Act, how does society then get access to these patents uh, here? Will they, be, will they be licensed or not? In principle, there is a possibility with the Bay Dole Act to make sure that the patents, that the government retains rights on these patents here and can still ask for licensing uh, uh, agreements uh, here. But that's again, a very delicate balance on how often the government is going to use this because in the end, it's the, always this balance between long-term incentives for innovation versus making sure you get the, the returns uh, in the long term for society. So delicate, but not. Uh, but it's not that the government doesn't have the incentives uh, to do so, but has to play this very carefully uh, here, short-term versus long-term. Thank you. Um. Uh, to give his feedback on all the questions already asked. Okay, good. Yeah, if you don't mind, I'll, I'll start with that one. Um, and, and I'm essentially going to say the same thing Ryan Hilda said, but in slightly different words. I, I don't think the question of government stake uh, in in companies in which investment has been made is the is is particularly important. I think much more important are the other incentives um, that Ryan Hilda was talking about and how they're deployed. Um, to the extent that it's been tried. In particular, recently, I don't think it's been terribly successful. We've seen quite a few uh, French government investments in companies where what ended up happening was it actually created an incentive where when there was trouble at the company, everyone went to lobby the government. 
Um, and that's not a particularly productive um, situation to be in. Now, that's not to say that this shouldn't happen. I'm just saying the experience hasn't been terribly positive. On the other hand, in the United States, and I'm to this day outraged by this, in 2008, an enormous amount of taxpayer money went into the economy to essentially buy out, bail out the largest uh, financial institutions in the country, and the government did not take a stake in those institutions, which I think was outrageous. I think taxpayers should have had a, um, a say in that, and for ideological reasons, uh, the U.S. shied away from doing directly essentially what it was doing, which was uh, nationalizing uh, these companies with a view towards restructuring them and selling them again later. So the verdict's still out on this, and I think a lot is, as Ryan Hilda put it, if one does it, one has to be delicate and needs to understand what the objectives are and what they're not. Um, I, I do, if you don't mind, I want to go back to the previous question, though, because I, I need, I, I'd really like to say a couple of things about science and the role of science uh, in, in public policy and in democracy, because I think this is a crucial issue. Um, we're living through a revolution, and it's not simply the COVID. It's basically uh, everything that the Internet has brought to our society. This, this is as big as what Gutenberg did. It means that information now travels sideways, up, down, here, there. Everyone has access to everyone. And so far, we've seen a lot of the negative consequences of that. I don't think I need to go into a lot of depth because we read about them in the newspaper every day. We know about misinformation. We know about disinformation. We know the way it's distorted our democracy. We see the results of all that. But at the end of the day, it's perhaps worth reminding that the process is a fundamental democratizing one, uh, that the Internet has brought many more people into the public discussion than were there before. And this has put a lot of strain on people who were used to being in the discussion alone in previous years. Now, now, what I'm trying to say is we need to get out there and defend science. We absolutely need to restore its role. And it's going to take a little while for this all to shake, shake out. Um, uh, we need to get the stake actors, state actors out of this. Uh, there are governments out there that use the internet uh, deliberately and as a matter of policy uh, uh, to undermine us. These are acts of war as far as I'm concerned and we should take them as seriously as that. But we also need to remember who we are and how we got here. And maybe I say two brief lines about that. We are, all of us on this call, children of the Enlightenment. It's the scientific method that brought us where we are today. And um, we've seen that come and go. Um, the Greeks started us on the path of science, and a lot of that was discarded. We had, of course, the Dark Ages ahead of us and quite a few other very difficult things. Uh, we won't be able to defend the role of science in our society unless we go out and actively defend it. But we won't do it in dictatorial ways. We'll do it in democratic ways, uh, but with conviction. And that's what I wanted to say about it. Thank you. Take um, one other question um, from um, our colleague Andres Garcia um, about academic research structures. So the report uh, says that academic research structures and the emphasis on individual short term personal outputs fits uneasily alongside the need for more transdisciplinary research, more novelty and risk-taking in research that has become apparent in this crisis motivated by COVID-19. And the question is, what policy measures uh, would you highlight to help build a diverse, appropriate, skilled and motivated science workforce that would be more efficient in tackling future situations of crisis? Who wants to kick this off? Okay, so these are all very big questions. <laughs> so, um, first I'd like to say that actually researchers, and maybe I'm a bit naive and I'm also a bit biased because I live in this world, researchers in themselves, they, they, they are challenged by research questions, and research questions are by nature crossing different uh, boundaries. And being able to, to cross these boundaries is a challenge and a puzzle that the researchers definitely like. So, so if you really care about pushing the frontier, and that's what most of the researchers really care about, they are not 
they are not in itself uh, closed and they, and they know they need to be open and they're actually looking for that. It is this, the science system itself that builds these, uh, these uh, barriers and make it way more difficult for researchers to cross uh, boundaries here. The way in which uh, universities are being organized by departments, uh, organized by the teaching uh, and, and with very, where it's difficult to, to communicate and to contact uh, across departments make it difficult, but also the funding system itself too uh, here, because a lot of funding is really uh, selected by, by disciplinary panels uh, here, which are evaluated by disciplinary experts uh, here, and where transdisciplinary research usually get biased against. There was a lot of research that showed this. Uh, transdisciplinary, uh, because it's evaluated by, uh, by, by uh, monodisciplinary panels uh, and evaluations. And of course, if scientists know that any transdisciplinary approach gets biased against and then they get less funding for that, uh, that uh, changes their incentives uh, here. So I think it's rather than, than, than putting the emphasis on researchers need to change, it's need to change the sticks and carrots of the researchers uh, here uh, and definitely the funding system and the way in which universities are organized is a very important driver uh, here to, uh, to uh, activate the researchers where they want to be. <laughs> Yes, only yes. I'll I'll be very fast because I think Ryan Hill has done a, a really good job on on this. Just to add, um, she's absolutely right. It comes down to money and promotions and academic careers, and you need to change some of the the sticks and carrots to get people to more easily move. Uh, I I would say she, it was an earlier comment she she said about expanding the type of networks, not getting into one set group, um, and this is important. So we need uh, mechanisms for, for pe people bumping into people in different fields, which again, don't really exist. We tend to have academic conferences that are in a particular uh, domain and don't mix. And then I would just end by saying, I think as science and technology becomes more digitized, you're beginning to see some of that blending occur. You're seeing a lot more uh, people, students now, have uh, mixed uh, programs, which which I think bring together uh, different fields. So I have hope that in the future, this will take off more, um, but I think the government can push it through its funding mechanism. Uh, thank you. Um, shall I go to Paul first? And maybe there is still time for one question afterwards. Um, on that question, well, let me, um, I don't have a whole lot to add, except maybe to say, um, go back to what Ryan Hilda said in her first uh, intervention about mobility, uh, because I agree, that's tremendously important. And if I can steal from my old playbook too, I, I'm struck by the fact that it's a policy uh, that is, um, it's transversal, that essentially the way to have, let scientists be mobile is to address other issues. For example, portability of pensions. That would make an enormous difference uh, in the career of, um, of scientists. So when I think about innovation policy, I think about it as much more than simply investment in science, although that's very important. We need the other pieces of the Christmas, we need the other ornaments on the Christmas tree too. And uh, portability of pensions would be a very good place to begin. And I could probably think of a few others if I put my mind to it. That's, that's, that's indeed a key issue. Um, we can maybe still take one, one last question, which I have here. Um, would you agree with the view that all policy decisions should be based on scientific evidence only? Um, doesn't, it come, doesn't this come with the risk that science may replace politics and that policy, political decisions are dressed up as scientific ones? So, do we risk that uh, science replace politics? That's a bit like sending all the members of parliament home and putting the Joint Research Center and other scientists instead. Um, so, I so, last round, yeah. so maybe I can answer you from a scientist perspective here. That's definitely not the role that science wants to play. <laughs> science doesn't want to take the decisions. That's for the political, but science wants to 
to bring forward all the different views and perspectives and uh, that that uh, that we know from science here but making choices that's uh that's up to the politicians here and, and science scientists don't want to do that <laughs> and they also make that very explicit here so they bring to the discussion arguments in favor arguments against so that you have all the evidence <laughs> and then it's up to and and that evidence always requires making choices uh, here because the evidence never goes in one direction only here it's a choice you have to make and these choices scientists cannot take and don't want to take that's not their role so in that respect it's really not replacing <laughs> it's really complementing uh, making sure that those that take the decisions are well informed with the right kind of evidence This, this I found very interesting. It has a box of on the principles for effective and trustworthy scientific advisory systems under scientific uh, ad advice in times of crisis. So I was surprised to see it repeated because it comes from a study from from a report from 2015. But of course, it's still valid. Uh, these rules never change. Um, Paul, do you want to give uh, to come back on this for a last uh, intervention? Well, I just maybe wanted to say, usually this question of having scientists replace policymakers is not the one I hear. Usually people say, what about AI? Because artificial intelligence, according to what I read, is going to replace all of us. Uh, but I have a standing offer out to anyone, by the way, anyone on this call, if you can invent an AI that's um, uh, good enough to speak at an event like this or um, even chair a meeting like this, I would love to see one of them take my place. Um, and, and let me say, frankly, I don't think they can do it. And I'm trying to make a point that we, we, we insanely overestimate uh, what artificial uh, intelligence can do. It can certainly calculate better than we can. Uh, but all of the human intelligence that's on display in a conversation like this is, is certainly for the foreseeable future well beyond them. And frankly, I think forever, I think that human intelligence is a unique thing that no machine will ever match. But we have that discussion some other time. Yes, I'm also a bit curious. <laughs> Can't hear. Sorry, I'm muted. Yeah. yeah. Yes, I'm also curious uh, if we ever will have an AI system that uh, produces the EPRS briefings uh, in the right uh, format with all the right references and uh, focused on the needs of the members. But we are not that far, luckily. Um, maybe a last word for Andy Wickoff. Yeah. Thanks. I, I won't go into the AI discussion. That's for, for another day. I guess I would completely disagree with the idea of just making science the way to decide issues. Um, first of all, in, instead, uh, we need autonomy of science from those policymakers. I think to give them uh, an ability to be very transparent, and that, that will help build trust, I think, around scientific uh, evidence. And if, Ryan Hildwitz was saying politicians have a different role. Um, their decision making has to go beyond just the pure science to incorporate in many other factors. This said, and let me just end with this, because uh, I think as my intro, I was attributed for being at the Office of Technology Assessment that provided, tried to provide independent uh, scientific advice to members of the US Congress, not too far from what you are doing with the EU Parliament. Um, I think it's very important that policymakers have a better grounding in science and they have an aptitude and an appreciation for what it can do and what they can't do. Uh, I think we found through the crisis that there have been some pretty amazing gaps that have hurt um, our ability to uh, cope with the pandemic. And I think bringing in more scientific advice, not as decision makers, but just as advisors, is an important thing that we have to keep uh, in mind going forward. So let me end by thank you for hosting the event uh, and for the opportunity for us to present um, the STI album. May I first felt the thank you all and the Paul and Renilde and maybe pause for a, a closing word the floor again to Anthony Tisdale. Thank you very much indeed, Libe, for uh, so expertly uh, moderating that discussion, and thank you to all of our speakers. 
in no particular order to Paul, to Ryan Hilda, to uh, Andrew, also to Jesse Buzak, who was with us earlier, and, and once again to Libe for most recently uh, chairing that session. Um, I thought that last question was really fascinating. Uh, I have views on it myself, which I'm not going to bore uh, the colleagues who are um, on the line right now with. Just to say that I am, based on my own personal experience, I would say that there is a culture gap or clash between the scientific world and the political world. The scientific world essentially is the search for some uh, certainty or definitive truth in some way. Whereas the political world absolutely thrives on uncertainty and ambiguity, and they're really quite different cultures. And that's one of the reasons why the interface has proved so problematic. And I think there's a huge opportunity in the current crisis to try to align those two cultures. And I think the work the OECD is doing on that in a small way, which we're trying to do in EPRS and many other organizations are involved in, is very helpful right at this juncture in terms of trying to glue those different um, cultures together for better policy making. So uh, thank you all. Thank you also to um, everybody who's been uh, online. We peaked, I think, around 66 people uh, and it was a great discussion. The next EPRS event, next policy roundtable will be um, next uh, Thursday. Uh, we'll be doing a discussion at that point on public opinion uh, and the coronavirus crisis. How has public opinion shifted? Uh, and what's it got to say about the EU and its handling of the coronavirus crisis? That'll be something we'll be doing in conjunction with DG Communication and it'll be based on the most recent Eurobarometer um, uh, survey. That's Thursday, um, the 4th of March at 12, uh, uh, at 1.30, sorry, 1.30 um, Central European time. And we look forward to as many of you as are on this call being on that one and joining us again for our next EPRS event. Just remains to me to thank everybody once again and have a very agreeable afternoon. Bye bye. <laughs>